Terry Thompson is the Regional Communications Manager for the Magic Valley region of the Idaho Department of Fish and Game. After graduating from the University of Idaho and a brief career with Blaine County Emergency Services, he started his fish and game career in 1991 based out of headquarters in Boise. After 10 years with Idaho Fish and Game, he moved to Alaska, where he began a new stint with the Alaska Department of Fish and Game Division of Sports Fisheries for nearly 20 years. Terry recently retired from Alaska Fish and Game and returned home to Idaho, where he rejoined the Idaho Fish and Game in May of 2019. Kaz Thea is a professional biologist who worked for the federal government, conservation organizations, and as a consultant protecting habitat for species at risk. Through her conservation work, Kaz cultivated a lifelong passion for community engagement. She co-founded several local nonprofit organizations focused on conservation, recreation, and education to improve quality of life for her community. Kaz was elected to the Haley City Council in 2017 and is presently serving a four-year term. Kaz holds, holds a master's in natural science from the University of Idaho and loves to recreate in the mountains, on trails, and paddle rivers with her family in her spare time. So um, welcome to you both. And thank you, uh, Terry, uh, right now uh, for um, uh, taking the time to share with us uh, about the Wood River um, Wildlife Smart Communities Resolution. And so what I'm going to do is I am going to share the PowerPoint. And um, let's see. There we go. And so just uh, tell me when you need me to uh, move this forward. Great. Well, thank you very I, much. And... Terry, I'll just uh, oh, interrupt that I need to let somebody in for this presentation. So um, you might have to say next a little extra loud to me for when it's time to shift it forward. Okay, sounds great. Well, one, thanks everybody for uh, joining this afternoon. Um, uh, even though we're doing this twice, uh, it's great. I think the more we can talk about uh, the wildlife smart communities uh, effort in the Wood River Valley is great. And so um, hopefully this will be informative and uh, help us as we uh, engage the community in, in conversation about how to um, reduce human wildlife conflict in the Wood River Valley. So um, with that, just uh, very quickly, just kind of an overview of what we'll be talking about this afternoon. Uh, we'll start out by kind of uh, some definitions, if you will. What does it mean to have human wildlife conflicts? Um, and because we'll be using, I'll be using terms and hopefully Kaz will, if she can join in. And we just wanna make sure everybody has the same common uh, definitions of what those are. Um, we'll talk a little bit about how this uh, coalition got started um and who makes up uh the coalition uh we'll talk some examples about what does uh human wildlife conflict look like in the wood river valley uh, and probably uh, most importantly what can local residents do uh, because and we'll talk about this in the presentation uh, this is a community-wide effort um, this is not something to, to be effective uh, this needs to be uh, every person doing their part. So uh, we'll talk about that a little bit too, and then some next steps. Um, so with that, um, let's go ahead and get started. So next slide, please. Great, so I've used this term several times already, uh, human wildlife conflict. And when we uh, think in terms of that, it's some type of an interaction between wildlife um, and humans. Uh, and typically it has some kind of a negative outcome. Unfortunately, many times that negative impact is on people, on the wildlife itself, but, but it can be a negative impact to people in terms of um, property damage, uh, personal injury, 
and worst case uh, scenario, it could even lead to a human fatality. Um, so, you know, as I point out in this slide, um, human wildlife conflict can take many forms. And uh, our goal as a fish and game agency, and we hope to work with the communities in the Wood River Valley, is to reduce uh, human wildlife conflicts. And so that's what we'll talk about tonight, which is, you know, and I'm, I'm just going to point out these pictures, you know, we have had uh, moose and uh, elk falling into daylight basements, going through window wells. We, the middle picture shows a mountain lion peering into a patio door up in Ketchum. That was just this last uh, winter. And then um, obviously one of our biggest, uh, uh, most common conflict is with uh, residential garbage and uh, most typically black bears. So next slide, please. Just uh, heard from Kaz and she's on her way. Okay, great. So uh, what types of, of conflicts when we say human wildlife conflicts? Because um, when we talk as a wildlife agency, uh, there's different gradations, if you will, of conflicts. One is an encounter where that's unexpected. It can be a direct interaction but there's no real incident. Uh, I referenced the picture to the left with the two moose. Uh, that moose is the cow that uh, has the conjunctivitis that, that we went up and darted a few months ago, treated it with some antibiotics. That is what we would call an encounter. Um, people came upon wildlife, nothing happened. Um, the next one up could be an incident where uh, either people or the wildlife has to take some kind of action to uh, stop the incident, causing the wildlife to flee. The middle picture there, um, you see a, a large male mountain lion running across in the snow. In the lower right-hand corner of that picture, there's a, one of our officers uh, shooting um, the uh, lion with uh, rubber uh, pellets. Uh, that is what we were doing. We were hazing this lion who was living outside of a back door in Ketchum and uh, uh, not a place that we want uh, mountain lions to, uh, to day bed. And then a uh, picture on the right would indicate an attack. Um, last year, we had nearly 100 incidences or um, uh, things that happened in the Wood River Valley, um, all of the above. Oh, Terry, I'm sorry, I have just uh, muted you. <laughs> I don't know how I did that, but <laughs> I muted you right where you said there'd been uh, about 100 uh, attacks, you said, in the last year? No. So we had um, uh, a variety last year, of just about 100 situations um, that included encounters, incidents, and attacks. Um, we did have... Um, three pets that were uh, fatally injured in mountain lion attacks last year, a couple up in Ketchum um, and one in Gimlet. We did have several other dogs that were attacked but uh, survived. Uh, many uh, house cats that uh, we don't know what happened to them, but we suspect uh, probably mountain lions because the cats uh, no longer came home. So. Um, you know, it, uh, and I think that is kind of what drove us to have this discussion today. So um, next slide, please. Um, Terry, just a quick question. Have, have there sure. ever been humans that have been injured or killed by wildlife? And I don't mean like where there was a, an, an automobile accident because somebody hit an elk or an elk hit yeah. a car, but um, has that ever happened in our area? So um, the research that we've done here internally within Fish and Game, we don't have any documentation of a human fatality uh, caused by mountain lions. Um, there have been people that have uh, been injured. Um, there have been uh, instances in other states. Uh, state of Washington had, I believe, one fatality last year, as did the state of Oregon. 
So it is not out of the realm. I, I think if you were to go back historically, that number nationwide is probably less than 30, uh, where it's actually um, uh, fatality has occurred. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about things that have happened in Colorado because uh, in the Boulder area, they did have a fatality in the early 90s from a mountain lion. Um, and uh, because we'll, and we'll talk about this uh, shortly. It's the uh, a lot of times it's unfortunately those kind of attacks that that uh, are the impetus to have us as residents and local communities uh, take action. Thank you. You betcha. So um, just the coalition or what we what we. It's a very long name, the Wood River Valley Wildlife Smart Communities Coalition. Um, this came about last year when we started having uh, these uh, attacks on pets, um, many, many uh, observations of lions, especially in, in the area. And so we called a meeting, uh, brought uh, leadership from the cities of Ketchum, Sun Valley, Haley, uh, Blaine County Commission, uh, Mike Goitendio with Clear Creek uh, Disposal, uh, Betsy Mizell with Idaho Conservation League. Um, we brought everybody together to say we're having uh, a increasing number of human wildlife conflicts and what can we collectively do to reduce those conflicts and it doesn't have to mean just winter type conflicts, you know, especially with the lions. But, uh, you know, uh, unfortunately, uh, we have had to euthanize black bears in the Wood River Valley over the last uh, probably several years as, as these uh, bears become food conditioned. Uh, these are all situations that can be changed in a more positive outcome. But again, it's gonna take a collective effort on the part of everybody in the Wood River Valley to be successful. Great, Next I slide, just wanna welcome our other presenter, um, Kaz Thea, whom I uh, introduced a little bit earlier and who is running just a little bit late. So she just joined us, so that's terrific. Sorry. Great. No worries. <laughs> nope. So Terry, yeah. are you ready so for Kaz the next? Yeah, I'm just going to say, Kaz, um, you know, I just introduced uh, who kind of sits in that coalition. Did you want to add anything to the slide? Um, <laughs> Sorry, I put you on the spot there. <laughs> yeah, I just, uh, I just think that it's been a really productive coalition with a lot of big diversity of people in the group. And um, yeah, we're trying to just come together to be a voice for the diverse needs of wildlife in our valley. And I think we've gotten really great feedback from the greater community that knows about us. And um, I think that we're all about action. So education and outreach, but also if there's any action that we can take. And we've already had a, a number of wins, you know, bringing resolution to the communities and all. So anyway, I'll, I'll let you go out, go ahead and see where you're at. <laughs> okay. And, and I'll say just very quickly, um, uh, huge thanks to Kaz. She has been um, a key uh, individual as part of this coalition. And, um, you know, it, it takes, as we always like to say, it takes a village. Um, Kaz has been a great uh, uh, individual to have in this uh, working group of the coalition. And so I really appreciate having her join me today and um, because she brings the more local uh, perspective to this discussion, as well as me from the state's Fish and Wildlife Agency. So uh, next slide, please. So this is just kind of a very quick graphic that uh, uh, this represents the the mountain lion situations, and I don't want to call them, an, I keep wanting to use the word incidents, but that is one of our three definitions. So this is a collection of attacks, encounters, uh, sightings, or incidents. And the, the takeaway message on this is that 
Um, this is not just a Haley problem, a Ketchum problem. Uh, human wildlife conflict occurs the breadth of the valley. And, um, you know, it's very obvious that, that all of these are happening within uh, communities, residential areas, um, in neighborhoods. Uh, that is concerning to us as an agency when we start having uh, a large predator like a mountain lion that is taking up residence within communities because it, it can quickly turn into a public safety issue. So, as I said, this is kind of what drove us to come together as a collective group to talk about human wildlife conflict. And as I just want to add that um, we're a group that really wants to be proactive. I think we came together because there were a number of um, incidents that happened with mountain lion. And we know that this community loves seeing wildlife being sort of a part of the, the wild landscape around us that we live, you know, right adjacent to and within. Um, and we don't wanna see animals get moved or killed, um, but we also, you know, have to keep in mind that, that human wildlife encounters doesn't normally end well for either party. And uh, so we really want, we came together to try to be proactive and prevent additional and further conflict by providing that education, being that voice and um, working with the, the greater community, the cities, the county, as well as all the citizens that, um, you know, how can we be wildlife smart by thus the name of our group um, to live within wildlife uh, areas and yet keep them wild, keep us residents to be able to see them, but uh, to reduce the conflict. Perfect. Of course, I got a tickle in my throat. <coughs> Next slide, please. <clears throat> Sorry if this is uh, copping in your ear. Um, <laughs> so one of our <clears throat> the one of the first things that the coalition did was, and when I say we were tasked, um, I would refer to uh, city mayors and county commissioners that said, you know, what can we do that's a tangible product to kind of kick start the efforts of the coalition. And so Kaz and I sat on a working group and um, over several months drafted uh, a resolution that was then presented to the city councils of Ketchum, Sun Valley, Haley, Bellevue, as well as the uh, Blaine County Commissioners. And um, that, uh, that resolution basically uh, acknowledge that it's the responsibility of each commit each community to ensure that wildlife stays wild and that our residents, visitors, pets, and wildlife too stay safe. Um, and the overarching purpose of the resolution or the the um, acknowledgement by the cities is that it that the coalition will provide guidance, recommendation, and education to residents and visitors on uh, best practices that will make the, the Wood River Valley what we would call a wildlife smart community. Kaz? Yeah, yeah and I think that um, there's a resounding interest from all the jurisdictions, county to all the cities, um, to do just that. I think, uh, you know, this, I can speak for the city of Haley. We, we have been working with Fish and Game, particularly when it comes to new subdivisions. We have, you know, basically made it um, our interest to never close off access to public lands. And um, yet we also want to recognize that sometimes, you know, there's regulations, um, seasonal closures or other things. So we've adopted um, the fish and games recommendations, and we're going to get to that later, but, you know, there was this building of partnerships. And so this made 
a lot of sense. And when we came in front of the, the cities, uh, they were very much embracing all of it. Could you folks talk a little bit about the images here? Um, I think a lot of times when it's kind of cool to look out your window and see a big old moose sitting there or I mean you have to laugh to see all those deer seeking some sort of shelter under the trampoline or um, I mean I would be breathless to see two big bull elk uh, outside my front door so um, could you talk a little bit about just why you chose those pictures for this um, slide? Sure um, and trust me I love seeing wildlife. I mean, that's one of the impetus that, that drew me into this as a career. And, you know, seeing wildlife is wonderful. We, we love that and we want to encourage wildlife watching and such, but a big bull moose does not belong in somebody's backyard. Um, these are big animals. Um, while they may seem somewhat um, uh, accustomed to living around people. Um, I would say even docile. When it mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, um, that is an appearance, but it right. can change very quickly. A number of different things. A dog running up and um, uh, startling one of these animals, or if it was in the fall during uh, mating season or rut, uh, bulls and uh, bull moose, a bull elk, a buck, a mule deer can become very aggressive and those antlers then become weapons. And um, so, you know, again, um, wildlife is great. We love to see it. Our goal is to make sure that wildlife transits through our communities, but doesn't take up residence within the community. Thank you. I appreciate that. Sure. Next slide. Um, Cass, you want to lead this one? Yeah, so I one of the first things we did as, what's that? No, go ahead, one I'm of sorry. The, one, of the first things we did, one of the first things we did as a community um, or as a group is we wrote, uh, we decided to take action, we needed the cities to also have an opportunity to possibly take action. And so we thought, let's maybe write a resolution so that, um, uh, for instance, I worked with, with the mountain, mountain Rides a while back and we wrote a resolution for the cities to pass a bike friendly community. And so what we thought was, what if we became a wildlife smart community and that would you know resolution isn't like an ordinance but it does say we care and we want to help educate and we want to become what this wildlife smart community is all about and so we over many many meetings and lots of rewrites wrote a resolution in in language that the city could pass the cities and the county could pass and we called them and asked if um, you know, we could go in front of them and, and have them consider passing resolution. And when a city passes a resolution, you know, we would like it to be more than just something that sits on the shelf or in the files and take a look at what specificity is in that and maybe take additional action to meet what's in there. And so, you know, we're an action focused group um, and we were very pleased to go in front of each of the communities and have them resoundingly say, yes, we agree. And we would like to be known as wildlife, a wildlife smart community. So all of they passed, um, I think, unanimously in every jurisdiction. Uh, and, okay. Oh, sorry. Is um is the resolution that each council and the commissioners passed? Is it the same resolution? Yes. Okay. Because I'll include that when I send out the resources afterwards, and we may be able to we may be able to post that on our website too, so people can actually read the resolution. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
Yeah, and there's, you know, a lot of it is about education and, and outreach, but it's the kind of community we, we hope we are already. And if not, we will find ways to become <laughs> if we're not. Um, and, and some of that is, you know, respect for where we live and respect for the wildlife, but also take ownership ourselves to do the right thing to not encourage additional wildlife human conflict and interaction. Perfect. I, I would just point out just very quickly, like Kaz said, um, we got resounding support um, from um, all five um, entities. And um, I just wanted to, to thank um, all the city council members and county commissioners. Um, there was um, often spirited discussion um, when these were brought forward. These were not just uh, rubber stamps. They actually had uh, some, some great conversations about that. So I, uh, I just wanted to, to acknowledge and give thanks to all the different council members and commissioners who put a lot of thought and energy into this as well. Next slide, please. Again, yeah. Kaz, you want to leave this one? <laughs> well, so I think we were the first community that it went in front of. I can't remember. Anyway, um, I think everyone enthusiastically was supportive and wanted to know what more we could do as leaders of our community um, to, to really be that wildlife smart community that we say we are. Um, and, and there'll be additional later in the slides, we can talk about a couple of things that, you know, we're embracing as part of this wildlife smart community. It's a good statement, you know, it's a, it's meaningful and, um, and there'll be more to come out of it in, in the years to come, days, months, years, as we move forward. Because we're pretty new, this, this whole thing is, you know, the, our group is fairly recently formed. It was January of last year when we first met, probably mid to late. So we're right at a year. So, um, and Kristen, I will provide a copy of that, of the resolution so you can post that on your website. Great, thank you. Next slide. Um, next slide. Okay. So, you know, we talk about these conflicts and um, and most of the conflicts are driven by a couple of different things. Um, one would be attractants that draws um, wildlife into what, as we refer to it as the sphere of humans, but um, probably a better way to say that is it draws wildlife into towns, communities, neighborhoods, um, you know, basically residential areas. Um, the picture on the left is a beehive that uh, had a, a bear get into it. Um, you'll notice that, and hopefully everybody can see it, but there's now an electric fence around that uh, beehive, um, which is a great uh, tool that homeowners can use to um, um, protect uh, things like a beehive, chicken coop. Um, electric fences are very effective when it comes to keeping wildlife out of things like that. The other thing is activities, you know, uh, Wood River Valley, you don't have to look very far to see people out on the bike path, uh, depending on the season of the year, jogging, biking, skiing, walking, um, you know, up on the mountain um, with the mountain bikes. Uh, that is the, the draw, I think, uh, to the Wood River Valley. When I lived up there a long time ago, um, you know, you didn't have to go far to uh, recreate in wildland situations. So, um, but all of these have the potential to um, uh, bring human wildlife conflict into um, closer acts or uh, having it happen more often. So, um, these are the kind of things that we're going to talk about now. Kaz, did you want to add? Uh, you know, I guess we. We want to be people that want to keep bees and feed birds and all that, but 
we also have to know what that means being in a place that has abundant wildlife. And the interesting thing about this is, you know, the, the beekeeper didn't necessarily know to put, um, you know, that it would attract bears and to put electric fence around it. And so there are solutions and we want to be solution oriented um, and provide the, uh, the information to help again, reduce the conflict by providing all that information. And um, Terry's gonna get, we're gonna get into a little more detail about how we might go about doing that. Yeah, perfect. Uh, next slide, please. So um, just, this is kind of a litany, if you will, of kind of the more common causes of conflict specifically to the Wood River Valley. Um, Number one on the list, unsecured residential garbage, without a doubt, is our biggest um, cause of human wildlife conflict. Um, it uh, has, it causes uh, food condition bears, which unfortunately, the, um, when you get a bear that becomes food conditioned, there is not many management options from our standpoint of what can we can do uh, because you can't relocate a food condition bear because they're either gonna come right back. And there's been many research projects that have proven this, the berry that comes back or you've now given somebody else the problem there. Um, the other thing that we have um, in the Wood River Valley is resident deer and elk herds. Um, we are basically setting the dinner table for predators when you um, have uh, resident deer and elk herds living within your community. Uh, half hour before we started the presentation, um, I saw a picture on Facebook of uh, 10 mule deer in the crosswalk in downtown Ketchum. And I think it was probably taken either yesterday or today. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, that is, again, I mean, it, it's a cool thing to see, but um, there is an unintended consequence that could happen with that, which is uh, lions could now be right in the middle of downtown Ketchum because that's where dinner is um, for the feeders. You know, I uh, it was I appreciate the fact that your next presentation with the library is going to be somebody talking about backyard birds. Mm -hmm. um, we all love to have uh, bird feeders out, um, and uh, uh, but in the summertime, bird feeders are an incredible attractant to bears. They can get tens of thousands of calories off of a large bird feeder. It's hard to imagine, but a, a pound of bird seed, I think if I remember the number right, it's like 25,000 calories. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, you have to be, again, wildlife smart if you're going to put out bird feeders. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about toxic vegetation here in a minute. Um, day beds for lions, that picture in the middle there is a picture I took last year of the lion right inside Ketchum City Limits that had day bedded um, within about 20, 25 feet of the back door of a house. They were repeatedly letting their dog out to uh, take care of its business. Um, unbeknownst that this lion was just feet away from, from the back door. Um, the other thing is pets off leash. One of the things I learned in Alaska pretty quickly is that you know, if you're hiking in the, in the back country and you let your dog off leash, they run ahead, um, they run into a bear, all of a sudden the, the dog says, hey, I don't want to be here, runs back to the owner. And what they've done is they've just led the bear right back to the person. Um, you know, um, moose and elk do not like dogs. They will a lot of times chase and, and functionally try to stomp the dog. So, um, you know, pets off leash, we all, I have a dog. I love to be able to walk him off leash, but it is a pretty uh, big attractant when it comes to human wildlife conflict. Kaz? Could you talk a little bit about the, the picture, especially if people have a smaller computer, um, the one that's between the mountain lion bedding and the garbage cans um, where there's a black sure. bear there? Yep, there's actually a black bear and a cub. That I don't was, know. Can you can you taken. folks see my cursor on the screen? No. So right below the, okay. the bear that's um, the cutout of the bear on the house, 
So this picture was taken out Warm Springs this last summer. Uh, that was a situation where uh, we had repeated um, instances of that particular sow and, and cub getting into residential garbage um, night after night. This picture was taken with a with a phone camera um, off the headlights of our officer's truck at about 1.30 in the morning. So it, it's, it's difficult to see and I, I apologize for that. Uh, but, um, and this will remind me to talk a little bit about how we need more of these kind of pictures as we go forward. Um, I, I think Oops. that we're gonna, uh, Sorry about that. I thought you, I was anticipating that you were telling me to move forward and I hit it. <laughs> um, I, I was just going to say that we're going to get into more details, particularly about garbage, because that's one of our action items coming up. Um, and I've been working last March before, right as COVID started to hit, maybe it was February before it really came prominent into our valley, um, I started working with Sage School students because they were looking for a project. And I have always reached out to students to do projects with the WOW students um, organization and just, uh, just fun science and conservation related projects. Um, one thing I did was we capped the, the outhouse pipes on all the outhouses on Forest Service and BLM land because animals were getting caught in those pipes and they were dying. We had um, even a fox dead in one of those pipes and birds get caught, owls get caught. And my friend who works with the bird, um, Birds of Prey organization in Jackson, he kind of started these screens that you can just cap onto the outhouse pipes and I did a big wow project and the students are so enthusiastic. They had a bake sale at each of the grocery store outlets here um, to try to raise more money and educate the community about what the project was. And we raised several thousand dollars through their bake sale so I could buy more screens and we screened every single outhouse pipe on BLM and Forest Service that's within Blaine County because it was part of the wow student project. And then I started reaching out to students because as we talk about garbage with bears, um, we thought, you know, maybe we could get uh, students to come up with a sticker that's on our garbage containers and say, bear aware, I'm bear aware. And the idea is to educate neighbors in neighborhoods to not put garbage out the night before pickup. And the students were super enthusiastic about creating a sticker that they designed and it was going to be big enough to be on garbage. And we'd have sort of ambassadors. Our idea was to have ambassadors in the neighborhoods to try to go along and talk to neighbors as people are taking out their garbage and say, you know, if we wait till the morning, you're not going to attract bears and which also attract lots of other wildlife, especially if they get knocked over or kicked over or whatever dogs and raccoons and skunks. And I mean, all kinds of, dogs for that matter. Um, and they were really enthusiastic. And the other thing they were going to do was create a poster for us to take to use as an educational tool to talk about some of these causes of conflict in the Wood River Valley. Um, COVID hit, we stopped, I'm going to try to reach out to the Sage School students. Um, again, because there was a lot of enthusiasm and the teachers were psyched, they had to come up with some kind of project and this was going to be theirs. So we'll see if we can get that back and up and running again. Next slide. Okay, next slide, please. All right. Yep. So just very briefly, because I know we're, we're gonna, getting kind of tight on time again. Um, when we think of working with local officials and decision makers like CAS, uh, city council members, mayors, and county commissioners, um, there's three things that that have been done in other communities. Um, one is working at removing attractants. The other is, as Kaz just talked about, education and outreach. And then 
um, a third uh, option, which um, uh, Vail, Colorado, which is the, the graphic there in the middle. So other communities have taken the, the side or the, the, the action of even passing ordinances. Um, I don't think ordinances is top of our list. In fact, I know it's not, Kaz can speak to that. But there are things that we can do immediately um, we feel in the Wood River Valley by removing attractants that will um, get us much closer to a, a wildlife safe community. Yeah, we, we as council, I can speak for the city of Haley, we'd rather not write ordinances for such a thing. So education is going to be really, really important. Um, and then our next idea as we get through this slide, the next, maybe the next slide or two, um, introducing other elements to, instead of changing human behavior, which sometimes is very difficult, you know, putting the garbage out in the morning as opposed to the evening, and sometimes not um, very practical for people if they go to work really early or whatever it is. Um, but, you know, our next idea is maybe to get something that's bear proof, because <laughs> we'd rather not write an ordinance, say you have to put your garbage out, you know, there's that's just not something we really want to do. Okay, next slide, please. Aha. So as Kaz said, <laughs> look at that. Great lead it's in, like Kaz. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So, um, you know, one of the best ways to remove an attractant um, is to secure it. Um, one of the things that I, I never even thought when I started this job a couple of years ago, um, was that I would become so aware of garbage, um, residential garbage in particular. Um, I've spent many an evening in Blaine County over the last year driving streets and uh, just getting a sense on how many people are putting their garbage can out the night before pickup, how many people are overfilling their garbage container, um, and I will tell you, it's a high percentage in both situations. Um, streets are lined with garbage cans the night before pickup. And the, the overwhelming number are over full, and thus there's no lid. But even if you could close the lid, there's no locking mechanism on that lid. So uh, there are companies out there. Uh, this is an example of these pictures here of a company. And the, these uh, pictures I took we actually have possession of this garbage can down here. Um, but it's what they would refer to as a bear resistant garbage container. Um, it's double walled, it has a locking mechanism. The nice part about it is it's what they would call automatic. And we've actually let uh, Mike Guitendia and his crew up there at Clear Creek Disposal, um, excuse me, work with these. Um, and they are automatic, it does not take the operator of the, the truck to get out and do anything. Uh, they don't have to modify their trucks. They just come up, grab the can, lift it up. And as soon as the can is inverted, the lid opens, dumps the garbage in the truck. They set the, 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 the can back down and the lid self closes. Um, they are, I will just point out very quickly, um, while they're called bear resistant, we are trying to change that terminology to wildlife resistant because, as Kaz said, um, uh, unintended uh, animals getting into garbage, skunks, raccoons. Uh, the interesting part about that is when you stop to realize that those are prey for mountain lions. So while residential garbage is not what I would consider an attractive to mountain lions, Unsecured residential garbage can very definitely attract a prey base that would bring lions in uh, throughout the year. So um, one of the things that uh, uh, we want to keep pointing out to folks: these are expensive. If if we if the communities want to make the decision to go towards this, um, uh, it it's probably it would add a cost to the monthly uh, service that clearly Creek provides. Um, and so I, but I want to make it clear from a fish and game standpoint, um, we are here to provide technical assistance. Um, but to go this direction, while we would absolutely support it, um, this is a local decision that's going to be need to be made by 
uh, the residents of the valley. So let me just explain okay. really quickly. Um, the city of Haley and the city of Ketchum have franchise agreements and the city of Sun Valley with Clear Creek. So we've been working with, um, with Mike Goitendia and currently we're all going through a process to update our franchise agreements. They're good for five years, I think. Um, and ours is up for renewal and we've, we've actually uh, extended the existing one for uh, two, two times now because we're currently in negotiations with our um, the city staff and Ketchum as well and Sun Valley because we want to be a united front with what we all want to, to do and what we need. So we want to possibly look at compost pickup food waste compost pickup, green waste compost pickup, uh, additional recycling, should we do, you know, single stream or, or separation? And the other item is that, um, do we want to add a f to our franchise agreement, uh, bear proof and wildlife proof garbage containers? Terry said they're expensive. And I will actually um, say that if you pass on the cost to everybody and you do it as a monthly increase in the fee, the city of Durango has done it and it's $4 and change per month to move towards for, it's going to be over a period of time, several years maybe. So it's not as, um, as painful, let me say, uh, monthly, if it's a $4, and change fee for possibly uh, making our community safer and uh, reduce the conflict pretty significantly. Durango has found, as as Terry's going to explain in the next couple slides, I think that um, the it has made a significant difference. So that's those are some of the things we're thinking of right now, and we're in negotiation currently. And we're trying to get on the same page with the other communities. So um, there's, you know, consistency across the communities for Clear Creek. And Mike has been super helpful and, and um, awesome to work with in, in these negotiation conversations. Yeah. So I live in Bellevue and um, as I recall, Bellevue does not have a franchise. Is that right? And that's why they're not part of this, the, the Haley Ketchum Sun Valley conversation. Correct. And if this does get proposed, um, it will go through public comment. It's, it's um, up for public hearings and people can provide any kind of input to city councils to uh, weigh in on the decisions that we would consider. Okay, so slide, it, it looks like the footprint's the same. And if I came out with my big bag of garbage, opening it up is not a challenge. Nope. It's actually very simple. I mean, there there is a mechanism that you have to use to open up the lid because it does lock. That's mm -hmm. what makes it secure. Um, but it's, it's functionally the same uh, footprint as the existing containers. These only come in two sizes, which is 64 gallon and a 95 gallon, I believe it is, which are very similar to what Mike and Clear Creek are already providing uh, residents up there. Okay, great. Thanks a lot. So um, as, as Kaz and I both talked about, you know, the, the Wildlife Smart community uh, feels um, very strongly that you know this this is a tool that's going to help us create more wildlife smart communities, and so uh, we would advocate for this transition. But again, I, as I said earlier, um, this is a community decision, um, and uh, so now and now's the time for the communities to get engaged in those discussions. Right, and the, the council might consider it, and um, it would be public hearing. Okay, next. So um, again, just very briefly, um, because we're, the Wood River Valley is not, this is not new ground. This has all been done with other communities. 
Colorado, California, um, Aspen, Colorado, classic example where they actually went to the to uh, an ordinance um, to that made people secure their garbage. Uh, Gatlinburg, Tennessee, which is right outside of Great, uh, oh, what's the name of the park? I just drew a blank. Uh, Great Smoky Mountain National Park. They had a tremendous um, problem with food conditioned bears getting into to garbage. Uh, they went to bear resistant trash cans. Their, um, their need to euthanize bears declined by 60 to 87 percent. Durango, Colorado, again, as Kaz pointed out, they, theirs was a, um, actually a research project where part of the community was uh, given bear resistant containers. The other, part of, the other part of the community stayed with the traditional uh, non-locking, non-secure uh, uh, garbage can. Uh, they, the conflicts went down by 60% where they had the bear resistant containers, compliance with ordinances, because again, they did go to ordinance to improve by 39%. But I think this next line is, is the key. And they said the effectiveness of the new containers was immediate. Um, use of bear resistant containers is not something that, we're, that is being tested to see its efficacy. It is a proven tool to minimize human wildlife conflict that comes about because of, of unsecured residential garbage. Yep. Yes? And, and just reiterate the cost, if you spread it out across lots of people and over a period of time, it's uh, much easier to uh, pay for it because they're expensive. And Mike, Coyton D for sure doesn't want us to buy our own. It would be something that they provide, but we'd have to pay for that upgrade. And that's how it would go. So, so he would buy them. We basically kind of pay back um, the price by having, you know, $4 and change or something close to that per month to, to eventually pay for the cost of the additional, you know, higher cost garbage containers. And just to quantify, because we keep saying they're more expensive, um, the the containers, the the one that I just showed with the pictures, um, those are about two hundred dollars a piece. So they're not several hundred dollars, um, but the the current uh, garbage container that's used pretty much anywhere you go in Idaho, those are uh, probably under fifty dollars. So. Uh, when we say significantly more, it could be three to four times the cost, but um, the cost is about $200, 200 to 250. Uh, next slide, please. Um, you know, we talk about education and outreach being very effective. Um, interestingly, they did a case study of a, a, a group of researchers. Um, and as a standalone project uh, program, uh, they only found one case, and that was in Canada, where education and outreach by itself uh, significantly reduced human bear conflicts. The University of Nevada did a study um, where they they're, they are encouraging um, that it's a suite of tools, ordinances, um, bear resistant containers. But they and then their point is that if you're going to do education and outreach needs to be an aggressive and permanent program to do that. It's, this is not a one and done, and we're gonna solve all the problems. This is something that's gonna have to be continuous and worked on because as we all know, Wood River Valley um, has a certain percentage of transient uh, residents. Uh, they come and go, uh, some are seasonal residents. So it's gonna be incumbent upon all of us and when I say all of us, I mean uh, government entities down to the individual homeowner, we're all going to have to work on this all the time to keep these messaging and, and uh, actions uh, consistent. Kev? Um, yeah, I, I don't have anything to add, thanks. Okay. <laughs> so just very quickly, if you're a homeowner, what can you do 
Um, and again, this is the kind of thing that um, we would suggest so that wildlife does not uh, take up residence around your house. Uh, the picture on the left shows a deck and it's got lattice underneath it. Um, if you don't enclose that space under your deck, that is a perfect place for a mountain lion to day bed. Um, I don't know about you, I don't want a mountain lion living underneath my deck. Uh, the picture there at the bottom, the two pictures, um, that is uh, elk that fell through a daylight window well a few years back up there. If some of you have been around in the Wood River Valley for a while, I'm sure you remember the situation. So um, putting a cover over those uh, window wells keeps <laughs> moose and elk out of your, your basement, as well as it, it's not a day bed for a, a lion. Uh, the picture up on the right, it's a pretty disturbing picture. That those are dead elk, and that picture was taken in Haley a few years back, and those elk all died because they ate an ornamental plant called a Japanese yew, which is highly toxic, obviously, to ungulates like elk. Um, so you know, just uh, looking at what you're putting around your house for landscaping. Uh, can even be uh, one of those things that everyone can do to reduce these conflicts. Terry, do you have yeah. a list of toxic plants to wildlife? Um, that's something we might be able to include um, with the resources we send out. Sure, and, and that's a great, uh, we'll talk about that in a minute too with our uh, website. Okay. And, and these are the kinds of things that the kids were going to um, create a poster for all the, the tips for homeowners. Um, and it'll definitely be part of that website that we are lucky enough to be able to develop with our, our group. Next slide, please. So, um, you know, obviously, Anybody who lives in the Wood River Valley knows that the valley loves to recreate outside. Um, that's the part that I love about, you know, going up there is that um, it's a very healthy community. Um, but these are classic pictures that, you know, we have people running bike paths up there. Um, I would say that uh, dogs on leash is probably not a typical picture. Uh, people like to have their dogs running off leash, but again, that's a, that is a very high potential for a, a conflict situation. Uh, bear spray, uh, you know, if I was going to be doing much recreating in the woods of Idaho, I would, as just a normal piece of safety equipment, uh, carry bear spray. Um, one of the things, you know, and I'm classic now, I'm sitting here, I have earbuds in my ears, um, because we all like to recreate with our earbuds in and either listen to podcasts or listen to music. Uh, you have to be very careful with that because wildlife will typically give you some kind of a warning if you're getting too close. You take away your sense of hearing, you put yourself at a higher risk of some kind of a negative interaction, um, which leads to the last bullet, which is always be aware of your surroundings. Um, you can pretty much assume when you are out and about in the Wood River Valley that there is the potential for having an, any one of a number of different species of wildlife uh, being close to you. So, uh, you know, a lot of times those negative interactions happen when um, either people are surprised or the wildlife is surprised. And so uh, just always being aware and uh, don't take away a sense of hearing when you're out and about. Those are all just uh, good things to keep in mind when you're outside um, doing any kind of outdoor activity. Okay. You can go to the next slide. I don't have anything to add. Okay. Um, so you probably will hear, you know, here's just <laughs> ordinances. Um, you know, Teton County has an ordinance that requires bear resistant structures, uh, bear resistant containers. Fremont County, again, uh, residential garbage has to be in an enclosed building. Pocatello has an ordinance that uh, prohibits feeding of wildlife. So, um, you know, as Kaz pointed out, uh, I don't think that's, these are looked at as the first choice. Um, you know, 
I guess they could always be considered on the table, but uh, I think as Kaz has said, it's probably not our first choice of a way to solve this, these problems. I think we'd like to put it back on to the, our, our community and say, you know, it's up to us to be responsible and to learn and to, you know, act accordingly. Uh, so we're not attracting animals um, and creating potential conflict. And so that's why we're pretty excited about our website and the website's gonna be able to be linked but from our, all the city websites and, and so, so, so forth. But um, any education and outreach we can do, we're, we're looking forward to it. So Terry, I, I, or both of you, I noticed um, in Pocatello about feeding, attracting wildlife. And I have a neighbor who likes to pour out sometimes buckets of bird seed. Uh, recently, he poured out a bucket of apples. Um, uh, he's a sweet man, um, but I also know that deer walk right next to his house and under trees and um, that mountain lions have been seen in our area. What, if, if somebody is that you know is actually feeding wildlife or putting out a salt lick, um, what should we as citizens do? That's a great question. Um, you know, wildlife in Idaho and wildlife in general is well adapted to living in the, the climate that we have here. So I know uh, people that that want to feed feel like they're doing the right thing. Uh, nobody wants to see wildlife starve and die. Um, my earbud just fell out. Um, <laughs> the, uh, um, but I guess the bottom line is uh, don't feed wildlife. Uh, one, uh, you know, many times people are putting out food that can't be processed adequately by the wildlife. So even though they may be eating it, they're not getting any kind of nutrition out of it. That can happen, especially in the wintertime. Um, and uh, there's that unintended consequence of putting out a tractant that's going to put bring deer, elk into your, your yard. And again, you've just set the dinner table for a mountain lion. Um, and then all of a sudden we have a situation where we have more lions maybe in an area that that should belong. So um, our message is don't we don't feed wildlife. Um, it while it makes us feel good as people, it really um, is not beneficial to wildlife and has so many unintended consequences that um, uh, will end up doing more harm to the wildlife than um, if we just let them alone. I also think as a wildlife biologist, you know, it's survival of, of the fittest out there in, in nature. And, you know, sometimes there's weak, there's old, there's sick, there's injured, and it's unfortunate, but, you know, when it's time to pass, it's time to pass. If we prop up those populations, then not, not just maybe the strongest survive and it's not as healthy for the population. Um, I know that some people argue we've taken so much of their habitat away and, you know, they, they adapt to shrinking habitat as well in numbers. There's carrying capacities and um, all, all that, you know, it fits with nature and, and we really shouldn't interfere with nature um, very much. We should let them be wild and let them um, live out their life as they, you know, as it's intended. <laughs> um, and yeah, it's, it's hard at times. Uh, but it, it's the right thing to do. So yes. if, if we see somebody doing it, should we call like our local police? Would it be better to call fish and game? What, what should we as citizens, when we see a caring person doing this, but maybe they're just not well-educated um, about the, the detriments of it, what, what, should, what would you recommend that we do? You know, we don't have any laws against feeding. Um, so, you know, uh, it's, it's not a law enforcement issue. It's an education issue. Um, our officers, um, our biologists are always available. 
Um, and we spend a lot of time going and talking to people about, um, you know, how to be good stewards of our wildlife resources. So, you know, we, we definitely don't want to make this uh, where you start pitting neighbor against neighbor. Uh, that is never a good outcome in situations like that. But, um, you know, a lot of, it's just, um, like I say, a, a lot of times these are well, very well-intentioned efforts. But, um, and it's just a, an opportunity for education to talk about how uh, while feeding may make you feel good, it's not actually beneficial to the wildlife. You know, there right. are times when, when we have intervened, like the fish and game intervened and helped the moose who had conjunctivitis. Mm -hmm. I don't know, did that slide come up yet? Yeah, it was right at the very beginning, the, the adult moose and the um, yeah. younger moose by the cars. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, and Fish and Game did step in and take care of the conjunctivitis because mm -hmm. it could have been such that the, the mom might have died, but you know, from not being able to see or whatever um, and getting weaker from, from that. But uh, generally, we should leave that up to the professionals and you know, mm -hmm. really try not to in intervene. I, and I will point out, because I think Kaz brings up a really good point, um, you know, because fish and game, we do feed. Um, mm -hmm. We have a feed site out Warm Springs uh, at Bullwhacker. Uh, but the, the key is that that feed site is not put there to subsidize the food budget of that herd of elk. That feed site is to lure elk for, and keep them up on the mountainside and not getting into downtown Ketchum. Uh, a couple years ago, we had a really bad winter, uh, 17, 18. Um, we had many feed sites throughout the Wood River Valley. Uh, and the purpose of those feed sites was to lure elk away from uh, roads and highways um, haystacks. So we use feed sites as a, as a way to lure um, animals away from uh, where conflicts can occur. Uh, the other problem with feeding is that you can concentrate animals and then all of a sudden, um, and I'm going to use an example that uh, uh, we've now become too, way too familiar with in the era of COVID, it can be a, like a super spreader event when you start concentrating animals um, that aren't normally in, in concentrations like that, and you get disease, um, and it can go through the herd very quickly. So a lot of different reasons why feeding is just not a good, good idea. Oh, great. I'm glad you explained that about the, the feeding areas. I know a lot of people will be familiar with those. So I'll go on to the next slide. Okay. Okay. And I thanks everybody for, for hanging in here. Um, okay, Kaz, here you go. Well, so, um, you know, there's, I, I think I mentioned a little bit earlier about subdivisions that we're building in Haley that are um, adjacent to public land, uh, BLM land, state land, whatever. Um, we always want to keep uh, access to public land and do our best to not never ever close it off um, if we can help it. Um, and we have decided, we did pass a resolution um, that we approved the administrative guidelines of fish and games. Uh, one is for winter wildlife closures and oftentimes you know, we have trails that access right from the subdivision to the public land. And we encourage and want people to go out and use those tra that trail system. But often, you know, often there's areas where there could be seasonal closures. It's really, really important. And we don't, um, we're not the ones that actually close it. We may coordinate closely with Fish and Game and say, yes, it's time to close it now because we've got X amount of, you know, snow out there or whatever. Um, and there's reasons why they're temporarily seasonally closed. So um, oftentimes south facing slopes are open in the winter and really important feeding, um, natural feeding areas for elk and deer to make it through the winter. Um, and if we go out into those areas, 
that they are commonly seen and, and found in during the winter and we cause them to run or you know uh, stress out, we could actually indirectly have them not survive the winter. If they do that enough of the time, then they're expending way more energy than is needed. And it could be to the point where they could die. Um, we wanna leave wildlife alone, particularly in the winter seasons when it's very difficult for them to make it through, particularly certain winters. Um, and so we will work with fish and game and adopt, we have adopted all the administrative guidelines that they put out and there's a book that, that has them in that and, and we adhere to all of that and encourage all our residents in these locations to adhere to that. And that's a partnership that we've developed over the years with Fish and Game and very recently made it even more official through signing this resolution. So I would think too, if you're walking your dog in these areas, you know that it's an area that has deer and elk in the winter time, that that might be a, a good time to put your dog on a leash. Um, so it didn't run up the hill and, and chase deer or elk unnecessarily in the winter. Yes. Very, very important. There's plenty of dogs out there that will chase them. And if they expend too much energy, uh, that is really, really not good for them, for their survival rate through the winter. And, and there, there are laws that would, um, that people could be cited if your dog is harassing wildlife. All right, thank you. Okay, uh, next slide, please. Uh, again, just very quickly, you know, when, when from a fish and game standpoint, as Kaz said, we work very closely with, with city, cities as well as the county. Um, we approach these uh, case by case. Um, it's not cookie cutter in terms of how we, um, we provide input on uh, how subdivisions are developed. Um, but we want to try to make sure that uh, as subdivisions are put in or housing uh, projects are put in, that we can minimize the direct impacts to wildlife. Fencing is a huge wow. problem. It's fencing, a huge fencing problem. Is really, really, it could potentially be a big problem. Fencing have to, has to be wildlife friendly. Um, I think it's uh, 42 inches at the top and 18 inches from the bottom rung down to the ground. So wildlife such as pronghorn could get under it because they're not very good jumpers. Um, and we really discourage fencing as well um, in certain areas. There's a lot of wildlife migration corridors that Fish and Game have um, marked on maps. Really, really important to establish where those are and know where they are because sometimes they conflict with, you know, they're, they're in and around neighborhoods and subdivisions. So we have to really be conscientious about adhering to the needs of wildlife and some of those things are in these administrative guidelines. Um, and, and they're all mapped, the, particularly the um, migration corridors are well established and well mapped with fish and game. So know where you live, know, know what you're doing and be sensitive to what wildlife do need to roam freely and get from one habitat to the next or from, from uh, you know, along riparian area corridor that provides them the, the important cover that they need or access to water if, the, if that's what they need. I mean, there's lots of different needs that wildlife have out there. Yep, uh, next slide. So this is, this is kind of one of those statements that, um, you know, as you think about it is that, um, and this is what happened in Boulder, Boulder, Colorado. They had ongoing issues with mountain lions um, and it was, while they knew they had an issue, it was a, it was really hard to get community level and agency level commitment to make change. And unfortunately, a situation happened where a young man um, was out recreating and was attacked and killed by a mountain lion. Uh, that is one of those events that now all of a sudden caused Boulder to say, 
we need to take action. We need to do something. Um, Kaz has pointed out many different times that uh, our goal in the coalition is to be proactive versus reactive. And so that's kind of what we've been talking about today. It's let's recognize um, where our challenges are. Let's identify tools that we can use to minimize these, um, these conflicts. And the other day I was reading, um, I think I actually heard it on NPR first, and then I went back and read on in the Mountain Express. Um, some of you may know Elizabeth Jeffrey. She's um, uh, very active in the Haley Climate Action Coalition. And she made a, a, a quote that it, her quote was uh, directly related to COVID. But I think it has relevance to human wildlife conflict as well when she said that COVID has definitely made it clear to us that the longer you wait to solve the problem, the less likely you are to solve the problem. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, you know, we are in a situation where we have escalating human wildlife conflict in the valley. Um, we're recognizing that. So let's take that recognition and make positive change, positive actions forward so that we don't have to end up making changes because of somebody getting hurt or worst case, somebody getting killed. Um, so uh, that's kind of what drives us um, within the coalition. Kaz? Nothing more to add. Okay. So what can you do if you want to live in a wildlife smart community? Um, Everybody needs to take steps to not encourage wildlife to live in your neighborhood. There's nothing wrong with having something transit through, but let's not encourage them to live there. Um, we need to, this is key, remove and secure attractants, garbage, um, beehives, bird feeders, um, any one of a number of different things. Recreate responsibly. Um, and the biggest thing now is let's commit to keeping wildlife wild. Well said. So um, we kind of made vague comments throughout about a website. So the coalition collectively put in a grant last uh, spring to the Idaho Fish and Wildlife Foundation. Um, we were successful in that grant and part of one of the deliverables that's gonna come out of that grant is a website. Uh, wrvwildlifesmart.org, so Wood River Valley Wildlife Smart.org. Um, right now, that website is under development. If you go to that website, you're not going to see anything yet other than maybe um, uh, the contractor has put up a page. I need to actually go look and see if there's something up there yet. But uh, the, the website is, er, is currently under uh, development. We hope to have it online by May. Um, Again, going back to uh, Kristen's comments about what do you do if you've got questions, um, you can always call our local conservation officer, Brandon Hurd. Uh, his number's on this. This, uh, this PowerPoint will be archived on the library website. You can always call us down here at the Magic Valley Regional Office. Um, we're here to help people. Um, we're here to help wildlife. And um, you know, when it comes to the human wildlife conflict side of things, um, we are obviously going to uh, err on the side of public safety. Uh, these are pictures that Brandon um, was actively involved in. Uh, a couple weeks ago, uh, I was up there with him when they, we got that uh, elk darted and we took off that swing set. The one in the middle was last, a, a year ago Christmas, the, the cow or the, the El cap got a tomato cage around its head. The, uh -huh. the hammock in the in the interesting part is the bowl that got the uh, hammock caught in its antlers is the same bowl that got the swing set caught in its antlers. So, um, <laughs> but um, you know, there's just things that residents can do to reduce the chances of these kind of conflicts going on. So, um, with that, I just wanted to say thank you very much to those that are uh, participating and listening. Um, we're real excited about this uh, opportunity to work with the, the communities in the Wood River Valley. And um, 
uh, we're all in it for the right reason. We want to keep wildlife wild and people safe. Yeah, thanks for tuning yeah. in. And um, it was a pleasure to, to do this presentation.